watching Facebook Live, welcome. Glad you're here. Okay, so today's class, this is a big class, I'm surprised. You know it's fall, this is hardcore gardeners. So you're still into it, even though the gardens are way overgrown. I'm starting to pull some of my stuff out. So tomatoes, they haven't produced in a month. They're out of there. Uh, squash, quite honestly, I'm tired of squash. I don't care if you're producing or not, you're out of there. So I'm starting to put kale and pansies and that kind of stuff. So shifting over to my fall type of, of, uh, of crops. So how many are brand new to the area? This is your first season growing. Oh, not too many newbies. Good, good, welcome. So um, you've gardened some. You've seen how hard it is. So there's no soil. Sun's <laughs> super intense, vaporizing stuff in like June. And then those of you who are on that wildland interface, there's a lot of there's a lot of wildlife. So we are surrounded by by animals, by forest, by things that live in, in, in nature. Uh, as you go up over the hill, there's actually herds of elk in Skull Valley, Baghdad, the backside of of, uh, of Copper Basin. There's deer everywhere, uh, mainly mule deer, like little cute white tails, super sized, put on steroids, and upsized. So they're like hungry. And then there's flocks and flocks of javelina, wild pigs, not flocks, herds, or whatever they're called, gangs. Is that what they're called, gangs? Yeah. Whatever. They're a nuisance, and they destroy. I'll plant something. They don't eat the plant. They just dig it up to go, hey, what you doing? Hey, this is fun. Let's dig here. He, he loosened it for us. No more rocks. So they'll come in sometimes. you got to figure out how to deal with that. Uh, bottom line, this is our class. What I've got lined up for you is a few techniques on keeping animals out. And then I've, given, I've put together some groupings of companion plants that go together, that look good together, that animals don't bother. Okay? So and then we can cover gophers and pack rats and stuff as you want. So we'll see where the class wants to take it. So we'll go over the plant piece, which is the main thing. And I, I just picked some of my favorite things that look good together. And I, there's half the nursery you can plant right now and animals will not bother. You just gotta hone it into those. If you're truly, truly surrounded and you're not fenced out, you're gonna have to hone your choices in and be more you can't have a cottage garden. You can't have a uh, that, that backyard mishmash of, of pretty cut gardens. You're gonna have to you have to pick the plants that really look good and then commit to the design and play with the plants that you have that you've been given options to. So you've got javelinas, you've got to pick the javelina plants, all ten of them, and have a great style and create more design in, in your landscape than just plant it and see what happens. Uh, so there's, there's some of that. The only true way to keep animals out of the garden, the only true way, fence. That's the only true way to not have issues. And even then, I've got pack rats galore. I mean, I caught two this week. So I've got a trap line in the backyard where the, if you come in, oh, welcome. Enjoy the peanut butter. It will be your last meal, and then you're, you're gone. So I don't want pack rats because they eat the hot tub. They eat the, the, they make nests in the built-in grill. They, they, they eat your patio furniture pads. They're just, a, they're destructive. Uh, they got into my grandmother's house, so for a uh, butte, they got in the attic and stripped all the wires. The house had to be rewired. So this is serious. You don't want to just play around and go, oh, all can live in harmony. They cannot live in harmony. There's a demarcation line around your garden or your house or your, at least up in the attic, where you go, nope, not welcome here. Out there, live and be free. So you got to have this, this mat. It's almost like the Marines understand this. You got the, the, the military folks in the room, they got this. We're going to go in and, and hit them with shock and awe. And then after that, they can be, live and be free out there. Your gardens, you got to really make a line going, they can't live here. So, javelina are probably the easiest to deal with because you can put up a little fence and it'll keep them out. Uh, they can they, they can actually climb steps. Uh, I've got a buddy of mine, up, he's got a two-story view on a deck. Two stories of, 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 of steps. They go up and buffet style on his containers. So he had to actually put a little gate out, the kids gate, to keep them out. I've also had other folks that use carpet tacks. You know, the strips, the wood strips with uh, the nails coming out. 
I mean, don't step on them, they could hurt, but uh, they put them at the base of the, of the uh, stairs. The animals, the javelina, came up and stepped on them. They went, oh, this is not good. Uh, I've got this thing stuck on my hook or something, and they, they won't go up. So there's some techniques like that that work really well. The number one that you hear is you put human hair up on a fence, you put ivory bars of soap hanging from a tree, um, coyote urine. <laughs> I'm going to go over the plant piece, which is the main thing. And I, I just picked some of my favorite things that look good together. And I, there's half the nursery you can plant right now, and animals will not bother. You just got to hone it into those. If you're truly, truly surrounded, and you're not fenced out, you're going to have to hone your choices in and be more... You can't have a cottage garden. You can't have a uh, that, that backyard mishmash of, of pretty cut gardens. You're going to have to... You have to pick the plants that really look good and then commit to the design and play with the plants that you have that you've been given options to. So you've got javelinas, you've got to pick the javelina plants, all ten of them, and have a great style and create more design in, in your landscape than just plant it and see what happens. Uh, so there, there's some of that. The only true way to keep animals out of the garden, the only true way, fence. That's the only true way to not have issues. And even then, I've got pack rats galore. I mean, I caught two this week. So I've got a trap line in the backyard where the, if you come in, oh, welcome. Enjoy the peanut butter. It will be your last meal, and then you're, you're gone. So I don't want pack rats because they eat the hot tub. They eat the, the they make nests in the built-in grill. They, they, they eat your patio furniture pads. They're just, they're destructive. Uh, they got into my grandmother's house, so for a some beauty, they got in the attic and stripped all the wires. The house had to be rewired. So this is serious. You don't want to just play around and go, oh, all can live in harmony. They cannot live in harmony. There's a demarcation line around your garden or your house or your, at least up in the attic, where you go, nope, not welcome here. Out there, live and be free. So you got to have this. This man, it's almost like the Marines understand this. You got the, the, the military folks in the room, they got this. We're gonna go in and, and hit them with shock and awe, and then after that, they can be live and be free out there. Your guards, you gotta really make a, a line go, they can't live here. So, javelin are probably the easiest to deal with because you can put up a little fence and it'll keep them out. Uh, they can they, they can actually climb steps. I've got a buddy of mine, up, I guess he's got a two-story view on a deck. Two stories of, 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 of steps. They go up and buffet style on his containers. So he had to actually put a little gate out in the kids' gate to keep them out. I've also had other folks that use carpet tacks. You know, the strips, the wood strips with uh, the nails coming out. I mean, don't step on them, they could hurt. But uh, they put them at the base of the, of the uh, stairs. The animals, the javelina, came up and stepped on them. They went, oh, this is not good. Uh, I've got this thing stuck on my hook or something, and they, they won't go up. So there's some techniques like that that work really well. The number one that you hear is you put human hair up on a fence, you put ivory bars of soap hanging from a tree, um, coyote urine. Uh, the, the easiest one to use that's organic, that's natural, is you, you use blood meal in the garden. And so what that does, blood meal is a native, that's an organic nitrogen source. So it's, it's dried chicken blood. And so you spread that around the yard and, and the rabbits and the pack rats, javelina somewhat, uh, kind of smell that and go, whoa, something got slaughtered right here. I could smell the blood. Stay away. This, this is dangerous over here. I think I'll go over to your neighbor's house and I'll eat over there because I don't smell that smell of death. And then it also fertilizes your landscape. The negative with that is it doesn't last very long. And so as soon as you get rain or water, it works its way in, the plants will absorb this fertilizer. So you have to reapply fairly often. So just be aware of that. Uh, they do make some uh, newer types of, of repellents. I brought a couple of them. I'll just, just show them to you. We've had great luck with repels all. This is, it comes in granular, and then also comes in a spray. And what this is, it's, it's basically garlic and some mint. There's different kinds of oils. It's got dried blood, dried 
not going to be a liquid and be dry blood. It's got infused blood in there, so it makes it smell bloody. It makes it smell herbal, uh, like a garlic. And then it's got this rotten egg kind of smell. Whatever you do, don't spray it by the front door. Because your house will smell of yuck. Out there, it's okay. And then, also, never touch your lips. This is personal experience. Spray it, touch your lips, because oh, you will be spitting for the next half a day trying to get that taste out of your mouth. But they love that tender new growth. It's soft. It's just it's supple. It, it has more sugars in it, that new growth. So after that, so if you can spray this, it says it works, you know, one shot, works for six months or six weeks or something. What I find is it works until the new growth shoots out. Then you'll have to reapply to keep the new growth at, at bay. Once this plant is matured, this is mainly in spring, uh, you probably don't have to do this that much, or it might last for six to eight weeks. Uh, but the repellents are great. They're organic, so you don't have to worry about your dogs, pets, you know, hummingbirds, husbands. You can kind of, it can be okay out there and not harm things. It's organic spray. Uh, animals don't like herbs. They don't like rosemary. They don't like lavender. They don't like thyme. They don't like oregano. They don't like mint. There's something about that oil in, in herbs they just don't care for. So they're using a lot of herbs in these repellent, organic repellents that are highly, highly effective. The secret is it's not once and done. If you're going to go with repellents, you've got to commit and, and really use it consistently, uh, and especially early in, in the spring season. And the goal, the ultimate goal, you either want to fence animals out so that they eat at your neighbor's house if they're not fenced, or you want to have dogs that scare them away so they eat at your neighbor's house, or you want to spray things on your own garden so they go, oh, these are nasty. We're going to go eat at your neighbor's house. The secret is have them eat at your neighbor's house, not at your house. You have to train them to not come here. And after a while, they'll get used to going, oh, no, you don't want to go over there. This is always nasty. We never go over there. We always go over here. And some of you, that's a hard thing. It's going to be more training than, than you think. Because you built your house on this mule deer path, Havelina Trail that's been there for generations. You put your house right in the middle. It's almost like a funnel coming right to your garden. So that's a hard one. You're gonna to have to actually train those herds to not to derail and go around you, which is no small feat. So consistency or fencing. In my own backyard, I've got the nice stuff, the things that the animals can eat in the backyard because it's fenced and I've got dogs. So I've got two full, two things happening. The dogs are predators, so they, they're scared of them, generally, although they're kind of lazy. They don't go after things like they should, although Scotty does. She's, she's getting older where she doesn't have the gumption she used to. Um, the front yard is totally exposed, and so, but that's where all the flowers are. The front yard is high color, high fashion, high. You just walk by the front of our house and go, wow, that's pretty. They might own a garden center. <laughs> so that, that one, we actually, uh, we, we're in an HOA where you can have fences in the front yard, you can have them in the back. But what I did there is I snuck out at night and I strung a wire through the garden on a two foot piece of rebar. I just, as during the day, I actually hammered them in, in the ground, so they were one foot above the ground, about 18 inches, that all, something like that, that far off the ground. Um, and then I put insulators on there, so the wire is actually electrified with a 12 volt, 12 volt current. So I have an electric fence going to my front yard that no one knows about. And I didn't enclose it because I don't want you to trip coming to the front door. I just wanted them to hit it every once in a while because, again, I'm just trying to scare them. I'm trying to electrify small animals. I just want to spook them so they go away and go to your yard, not my yard. And so there, after I got done putting that wire on, I spray painted it with brown and green paint, camo. But who wants to see yellow insulators? You don't want to see yellow insulators in your yard. Uh, so I spray painted them, uh, and then I put it on a timer. So it only comes in at night. I'm trying to keep Havelina out. There's a herd of them coming through our, our, my neighbor's yard, my yard. They use it as like, like, like a pathway. 
So I can't run it so they couldn't see it. I couldn't see it. My neighbors didn't know. No one's going to call the HOA on me. I'm all okay. It's going through the garden. It's not going around the garden. It's one foot off the ground. And it only comes on at like 10 o'clock to 5 o'clock. My wife is a very early riser. So I, she can scare them away starting 5 on. But if she gets shocked, there's going to be, it's not going to go down well. And if her dog gets shocked, it's really going to be bad. And so I got to make sure it comes off and on at the right time. Cheesy old timers, all it is. Um, after I got done, I took a piece of aluminum foil and I folded it so it was like a little tent. And I hung it on top of that wire. I just let it float there. And then I put some peanut butter on the bottom side. So the lead, Avelina, would go, whoa, 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 whoa. The, the, the promised land is here, peanut butter. Now uh, that first night, they hit that, and I don't know what happened. I didn't see it, I didn't catch it, I wish I had a camera. But all I know is there was wire laid all over the yard. I mean, just every, nothing was up. It was all over the yard. They must have freaked out. <laughs> so I set it back up. I put the peanut butter back on there just to make sure you, you got the hint. I don't want you, this is not a mistake thing. I want you to make sure you don't want to come here anymore. Uh, they were so terrified of my yard at that point that they haven't been to my neighbor's yard <laughs> anywhere around my property. They totally you were able to go across the street, they go down around. It's highly, highly effective. It cost me under a hundred bucks when Olson's grain. Any of your feed stores have electric fence. They're going to try to sell you this solar operated you know, thousand dollar thing, that's the 25 mile range. All you need is the cheapest, easiest. I think the smallest uh, uh, electric fence you can get is like a 10 mile range. It's very low voltage. You could touch it yourself. As a kid, we used to play chicken with it. This is boys. You try to grab your friend and grab the wire. See how long they can take to take the current because you're not getting shocked. They are because it goes for you. It's kind of kids have fun with it. It's not going to hurt anything. Uh, so I think that's another route you can go with that's highly effective. At the farm, we used the electric fence um, for deer. They would get uh, into the, they're eating our livelihood. They're eating the fruit trees. The deer would come in and eat the perennials. They would eat the, they would eat stuff. There we put a four foot fence in, electric fence, because they can jump that easily. They can jump up almost anything. Usually six foot will do it for them. They won't come in, but they can't clear any kind of distance. So there we'd run a double wire about four foot around the, that, that, that field of, of trees, and they wouldn't mess with it. Every once in a while, a young buck is just too stupid to know anything. would get in, we couldn't get back out. We had to shoo them out, kept the cattle out, kept the elk out, kept the deer out. So those are, those are some tricks that can work, be highly effective, okay? Uh, Gophers, should we just cover that one? So I've got gophers right now in one of my rental properties. They're going up and down the fence line, eating the plants. They've killed two arbovida already. They will be dead today after the class. So here's how I'm gonna do it. Uh, there's, there's a couple choices. One, I should have planted them in these gopher shields. If you know you have pocket gophers, we don't have moles. Those of you from the Midwest, East Coast, they have moles, we don't have those. We have pocket gophers. It's an underground rack, it's about that long. It's a short little seven tail and buck teeth that just, they're just ugly looking things. So they go around underneath, they've got this pocket underneath their chin uh, of skin, that's the name pocket gopher, where they scooch all the soil and like this little pouch of skin, they run up and they throw it outside the hole, so they're making runs underneath your garden. The things that they live on are roots, worms, and grubs. So they're eating insects, they're eating, eating your plant's roots. They really love agave. Uh, some of your native uh, native things, because there's a lot of uh, 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 moisture, protein, starches. Uh, there's a lot for them there. And so you'll find they get pretty busy underneath like big uh, yuccas. They can destroy them. I've had apple trees blow over because they love fruit trees. So if you see them, see a pocket, don't, don't let them go. You want to get on this and either shoot them away and, or, or kill them. Okay, I know this is, this is hard for some folks. Um, if you don't like killing things, this is a good repellent for gophers. Highly, highly effective. 
like folks in the Verde River, they come over and buy this at a case at a time. Because they don't want to sink, they don't want to sink the, the water and that kind of stuff. Uh, this is, you put it on the ground, and the main ingredient is castor bean oil. Uh, so you, you uh, they get it on their skin, they start to preen themselves, and probably get the runs or something. I have no idea, but they don't like them. They'll stay out for about six, this says like nine months. I find about four to six months, you're gonna have to reapply. Okay, but it's, it's highly effective. It gives, gives you a bubble at least where they don't want to be in that soil. Okay, good for pack rats, good for squirrels, good for chipmunks, um, that that kind of stuff. Where they're burrowing underneath the ground, highly effective. This is great if you're actually planting ahead. You're planting something. If they have any rose bush, which you know they're going to eat. This you stumble in the package. This is a one gallon size. We have a five gallon and a, and a 15 gallon. But you actually plant your plant. Like this is one of their favorite things to eat in all the world. They love kale. Everything loves kale. What's going on? What just happened? I'm going to eat this thing. Help me out, Ken, will you? Oh, yeah. There we go. So kale, this just keeps them from burrowing in. It's stainless steel. It's a mesh they can't get through, and it will last. So you can put this on a perennial, like a perennial vine or whatever, and it won't, they won't get into that. So if you've got gophers, that's a great resource. It would work for iris, it would work for daylilies, it would work for, for just about anything. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, comes in a five gallon, a 15 gallon, and then the one gallon, okay? And then your roots can go through this. And if they eat a few roots, that's okay. It's when they eat all the roots, your, that plant will die, okay? And you won't know it, it'll just all of a sudden dry up and fall over and go, what just happened? Did the irrigation go off? You look underneath there, you go, made his home underneath your... So we went over the uh, Bolmax, the gopher mat, this is what I'm going to do. This is actually the tool I'm going to use. This is probably like 10 years old. It's called a gopher probe. And where I see that little mound of dirt, I know there's a hole underneath there. I know that's an exit tunnel. Most of their living quarters are about 18 inches down. And you just can't get down that deep. It's too far. They'll go as far as four to six feet under the ground. Major runs. We're talking big runs, like a highway. They're going back and forth. There's not just one. There's whole families. There's colonies of, of pack rats or, or gophers. And so all you can do is hope to trip them into, as they're coming up with a pocket pouch full of dirt, they'll stumble into this bait called mole and gopher killer. You put this into this hopper here. And then as you poke around, you'll feel that this uh, probe slip as you hit the tunnel, you'll feel it slip all of a sudden. And then I'll just release what it does is you'll release a you know, this little, uh, piece of wire here, we'll release a door right there, and it allows you to get the poison underneath the ground a good four to six to eight inches, depending on how, how good you are. So it's highly, highly, highly effective. Uh, the poison, you got to be careful because if your dogs get into the poison, it's dangerous. That's why I like it under the ground. I never leave it exposed where anyone can see it except the gopher. Um, so that, that's what I'm going to use. There's also a trap. This is, this is probably a, one of the more highly effective traps. They do to come into it like this and it goes bump and the pens that kind of trap them. Yes. Yes. It's not an instantaneous kill. Used. Sometimes it is, sometimes it's not. What I did is I put a piece of wire on this, and I had the barn cat taking the gopher up to the top layer of the barn, where I have coyotes drag it out there, because they love gophers. It's like a free morsel, free uh, hors d'oeuvre. <laughs> Then I would spray the board that I tied the wire onto, red or bright yellow, or someplace where I could look at the field and I'd go, oh, oh, there it is, and I'd go find it. That's the negative with trap. You will be dealing with something that's swirling around. It's not quite dead. Um, it's gruesome. So I always took a shovel to the head or something, just quick and easy, painless. 
or there's buckets of water, or whatever. So you gotta have to deal with it. Uh, that's the one negative with this. And it takes more than one. You're gonna have to, I've had up to 12 of these going at a time. I would set it twice a day. Before I came into work, I would set it. And if you don't get a gopher in a trap within 24 hours, you're not going to. That's just the way it is. So then I would reset it in the evening when I came home, and I would catch about 12 gophers a day. So I'm, I'm really good. 50% hit rate is extremely good. Uh, 12 a day, I did that for a month, and I said, this is too much work. This is ridiculous. Then I moved to gopher pro. That did this, just because I was dealing with quantity. I was dealing with, with acreage. I just had to find a more efficient way of my time. I did get them out of five acres of, of the uh, orchard this way, and then I said that is just that we're going we're going all out and doing this. Okay, uh, be careful with your bait. Um, there are some strychnine based baits. Do not use those because the, the poison keeps killing down the, the uh, line. Okay, so so if you kill if you if the gopher eats the strychnine the bait and a coyote comes and eats the gopher, it kills the gopher and it kills the coyote, and then a hawk comes down and eats parts of the coyote or something else, or it just keeps killing. So we don't sell strychnine anything here because it's so incredibly dangerous. This is zinc-based, so only the thing that eats the bait, there's no secondary kill. That's just one thing to put on your radar. I can't believe you can still see strychnine sold. It's just ridiculous. So. This is much, much safer, but still use common sense. I had one customer, she put it out in a saucer and just left at the bottom of her steps. Like, idiot, I just want to slap her. Because um, then the dogs can come in and eat it, or, or the pack, she's after pack rats. But the javelina could have gotten it, the squirrel could have gotten it, the cat could have gotten it, anything could have gotten it. So use some real common sense. I do use this in my garden sheds. I'll actually open it up. This is not on the back of the label, but I'll just lay it down so mice and rats can get into it, but the dogs cannot. Be careful. Don't leave the garden shed open with the dogs. You've got to use some real common sense with this. But I get pack rats. They'll start coming in right now. So you'll find two things will happen. Snakes will start coming into your garage, maybe rattlesnakes, especially if you have uh, um, a refrigerator or freezer or something out there. They love that heat coming off the coil. They love that. Um, and then pack rats and squirrels and bulls, they'll start coming in. They're trying to find a home for winter. And your garage is perfect because it's warm, it's insulated, they're just finding their place. Mom kicked out the pack rats this week. I caught two very young pack rats. She said, hey, listen kids, you're on your own, go. Well, they came into my, my garden. They shouldn't have done that. So that, that's, just be aware, uh, snakes do migrate. So they travel at least two miles, up to five miles. They're actually moving from where they've been hunting all season. They've got a rock pile over there where they catch rats and mice and that kind of stuff. Now they're moving. If you simply leave a snake alone, it will be gone by within a day. It's just tired. That's a long haul, crawl on your, on your belly. You get back to the common hibernation spot that the, all these snakes come into. They hibernate together. Then they come out in spring and they start going out in different directions to take out mice and vermin, that kind of stuff. So just be aware, that's how, especially uh, you'll see right now, this is when a lot of rattlesnakes are seen. Uh, and you'll see them in the spring, usually about April. You'll see a lot, you'll have a lot of spotting the snakes. And then you don't see that snake because they're in their spot and they don't move a lot. They're just there unless you come across them. But they're not in major routes like your, your hiking path. They don't go where the hiking club is. Those have all been sent out. They're off. They want to be up in the piles of rocks where there's less interaction with human beings. Because human beings are deathly afraid of snakes. I did run across about a four foot racer or garter snake, or they're really good for the garden because they eat a lot of, uh, bless you, they eat a lot of, of grasshoppers, um, small voles, rats, that kind of stuff. They, eat, they keep the things down for me. So don't kill every snake. I know you folks from the south are terrified of snakes. Some of them are good. Some of them are, you just want to leave them alone, shoot them away, that kind of stuff, okay? They do actually make a snake stopper. You can put this as a barrier around your yard. I usually use this around the fence line. 
and a, a rattlesnake or gopher snake or snakes snakes will come up to this it's made of, of, of herbal natural uh, repellents but they'll taste this and go whoa I don't know what that is you actually see them veer and go the other way they won't go into that garden section so if you're really terrified and really I would say the only time you really got to use this is spring and fall that's when you're going to see most of your snakes or if you've got a, a, an asparagus patch that is just overgrown and you just don't know what's in there uh, this would be a good one to put around that uh, to keep the snakes out so you don't have to worry about it it is effective how are we doing questions Lester beetles. beetles this is not an insect talk this is a vermin a mammal talk we do have insects there are uh, blister beetles and gophers or not gophers but, um, grasshoppers out right now they're pretty bad I mean the ground is starting to move and they are have a ferocious appetite because again it's fall they're thinking I got to bulk up before fall hits and I got to lay eggs so I got next spring's crop of grasshoppers or blister beetles and so they get pretty ferocious right now they can decimate an ash tree I mean the blister beetles are clouds of beetles about one inch long about I don't know three eighths of an inch wide clouds of, I mean like the sky will go dark as they fly in, they'll land on this bird of paradise or, or Spanish broom. There's certain things they really like, and they will strip every leaf off the plant. Nothing is left but twigs. They don't necessarily kill it unless the plant was already stressed, but they can really make it look bad. This is one blister beetles. You do not have time to go, oh, I've got blister beetles. I think I'll head to the nursery tomorrow and get something to deal with that. No, no, no. You need to deal with this right now because there won't be leaves in three hours I mean it's like they do their damage like right now so you got to be ready for it. this one you want to have something on the shelf ready to go and what I use myself I use multi-purpose insect spray it's a spray we have in, on the shelf multi-purpose insect spray it's not organic but it's as kind as you can get and still be a chemical still have be effective uh, not, organics are not effective against blister beetles. Organics are not effective against grasshoppers or big caterpillars. You gotta kind of up your game. And I'm an organic gardener, whenever possible. But in my world, it has to be effective first. Then I go as safe as I can. And if organics will do it, I always go organic. That's, that's my take. That's how I come at it. That's how I help my customers. With the multi-purpose, I'll have a hose and sprayer. Something goes on my hose. It's quantity. You want, you need a lot of it. You need to spray the whole thing. Uh, so I'll power that up and I'll spray it down, and you won't have blister beetles. You won't have grasshoppers. You won't have. Uh, we're seeing right now uh, um, sawfly on your pine trees. If on the tip of a pine tree you see this webbing, looks like litter is starting to gather up on the. That's a little tiny caterpillar that's eating the, it's eating the tree. It's serious. It takes that guy out. So it's, it's a good, effective one. Uh, the baits right now do not work. Don't even bother. Okay. There's grasshopper baits. You had to use that two months ago. Yeah. Right now, they're so big and there's so many that they won't eat it fast enough. It won't, won't affect them fast enough to, to uh, affect your garden. And it doesn't work against blister beetles. We are seeing quite a few of that. Blister beetles come in gray, I've seen them in black, I've seen them in brown, I've seen them spotted, I've seen them striped. Almost like the clowns of, of, of insects. They come in every costume you can think of. But they all have this about an inch long, about three eighths inch wide uh, type of slender body. Okay? Do they cover that up well enough? Yeah. How, to spray, how to kill them? Multi purpose insect spray. Multi purpose insect spray, yeah. Oh, yeah. Gotcha. So his question was the sonic spikes for, for gophers. Uh, do they work? Don't waste your time or money. I sell them. They're down there in the solar. They're the best one I can find. Half of them come back. I think it's our soil or something. They don't do what the box says. But I sell them because so many people want them. Want them and they don't believe me. So I go here and we match Amazon's price. All that. We're right in there. And half of them come back. Don't, to my friends, I would never I would never use one myself and I wouldn't have my friends use them 
I would go traps or, or some other avenue. They don't work. The other one is a windmill thing. They'll say stick it in the ground. The, the, the action works. I don't, I've actually had a gopher come right underneath and build a home right there. Same thing with the Sonic thing. I've had them come right underneath. I've had, I wish I could get the Sonic battery operated uh, pulsating noise makers. They're good for birds. I've had some good luck with Avelina sort of, and then they get used to it and they come in about six months later and they start, they like ignore it, or they get used to that pulsating sound. So I haven't found a good one that actually works. So we're noted as a place where things have been tested, tried and true, and they're working. The plants grow. That's We, we have a high bar to meet. And until I can find one that really works, I'm not going to sell it. So anyway, that's a good question. Very good. Pack rats. Pack rats. They sh now I'm a southern boy. All rats should die. That just mm -hmm. rats are not good. They carry <laughs> disease. They're, and pack rats, you know what that is? It's like it's like a rat on steroids. It's bigger. It's like the size of a small child cat. I mean, it's, it's big, bigger than a regular rat. Uh, long tail. They they have huge mounds inside the oak trees and manzanitas. You'll see these big brush piles. That's a pack rat house or home. And they have everything. They've got everything. They love the reason they call them pack rats. They'll see something glittery, like a piece of uh, a gum wrapper or a piece of aluminum foil or pencils. They just love picking stuff up and taking it home. And but honey, look what I brought you. It's so special. And then when you open that that nest up, you'll see all that stuff in there. Inside, underneath the nest, this is how obsessive compulsive I am. I've actually taken these things apart so I can. I want to get the mind of of a pack rat. Underneath all that brush, is, there's a basically a bird's nest made of very fine, very soft, shredded <coughs> bark. And you'll see these two to three of them underneath all this piles. They're living in families. Underneath this, this just keeps the rain off and they nest in these. So if you find the nest that's in your, in your yard, get rid of it. If it's in your neighborhood, you're volunteer to get rid of it for them. But when you do that, those rats are going to go, whoo, out. They're going to make a nest someplace. And it might be in your drilling the hole through your heating, nibbling the hole through your hot tub, something. They, they'll, they'll find a way. I, did, I had a Facebook post last last year. I had a pack rat eat a hole through the cedar bark fence. And uh, I put a, a rat trap on either side, a piece of cheese, big piece of cheese, just, just, for, just for show. Um, and the post was, I have you now. <laughs> They don't like cheese, by the way. They like peanut butter. They like fruits. They like uh, uh, nuts, basically, is, is the way to go. Um, you only have three, three options uh, with pack rats. All of them involve death and decay. There is actually an animal stopper. This is a repellent that's for kind of effective on pack rats. The problem with pack rats, you can keep them out of this space of the garden, but then they'll climb up the deck come into the garden shed. They're so mischievous. They can get, there's nothing that holds them back. They can climb up any fence, get into any shed, go into any, they can go anywhere. So I don't know if this is quite as effective. So then you get into traps. What I use is a, I've got a rat trap downstairs in the, in the garden center. And the reason I use that one is, I've, if you've used rat traps enough, you've been zipped a few times. So I'm going, here, don't go in it. The one we have is just easy to set. So it's, it's got a top that's easy to bait it. And I use peanut butter myself. I'm very, very generous. I use a lot of peanut butter. And I'll stick like a almond in there or pecan. I want to be very generous. This is your last meal. I want you to enjoy it. <laughs> and so they'll come in and just zip. It's instant death. It's like next broken, that's it. Except for the big males. The males are about that big. They're huge. Uh, they may or may not die in. I've had, a, I've had them drag off, and it won't get gruesome anyway. They can get really, really big. The little youngsters, females, they're easy. They just go right out and they're done. So you don't need more than one trap, I find. You don't need several. They make glue traps. I don't use glue traps. I've got those down there. I don't personally use them because they're gruesome. I mean, it just, does, does, if I'm going to kill something, I want it to be done right away. I did have a neighbor, um, he live traps them. So he puts a piece of peanut butter in there, and he like, then he takes him out to Lynx Lake and releases. Really I told him, here's, here's the name of my competitors. 
<laughs> There's home people at Lowe's. Go, we need to come over there. Uh, but no, just kidding. Uh, but that's, if you're the way to life, trap them too. You could release them and let them go. Uh, go more than two miles away because they will come back. Guaranteed. Uh, they'll, they'll come back at you. So just be aware. Did I cover pack rats? Oh. There's only two things that. You know, you could actually put, you could put poison down. This is what I use in my garage, underneath my workbench, uh, and the crawl space. Things where other things can't get to, only a, a rat or a mouse could get to, I'll use that. Uh, back in the corners of the sheds over there, I'll just take a handful, just chuck it in the corner, go, here, enjoy, because I know nothing else can get in there. Uh, so just be careful with the, with the baits, okay? Long time, yeah. I don't know. Until, as long as it stays dry, once it gets wet, uh, that probably is I'm sure it loses effectiveness. So I usually replace it every year or so. I don't know. I actually don't know how long it lasts. There are three things. You got it. Pack rats are bad. Yes. Uh, we have a car for it, and I have pack rats in my car. Oh yeah. Yeah, under the hood. Yes. And the car place sold me a little flashing thing, Ritterat, what it was called. Okay. It didn't work. I've uh, had pack rats in there twice. Yeah. And so where can I put the peanut butter? So what, what you do, <laughs> yeah, this is a classic with RVs, a second car that's out there. It doesn't take very long, a week. They're making a nest up in the insulation of your car under the hood. Again, it's protected. It's warmer. Uh, so so they get in there. So her comment was she got a rental rat or flash a rat or electronic pulsating Things and it didn't work. As I hear that all the time. It didn't work. It didn't work. So you can either take this and just open it up and lay it right on top of the air filter or something. And they'll come into it. Um, you can take a trap, put it, put some peanut butter on it, and put it on the air filter or someplace flat on top of the manifold cover, that kind of stuff. But if you've got an RV and it's just sitting out there, you're going to get into it just a matter of time. So just be, you got to be defensively on it. Okay. What poison would you use if you use peanut butter, like on a little plate, under the car? Well, under there the I, I would just use, yeah, the, use the gopher, mole and gopher killer. Okay. I use this, this is the one I use, because I have it, I'm killing gophers all the time anyway, I just, it's effective for just about anything. It's just common sense though, you don't want it to drop off, fall on the ground. Because something else might get to it, like like a little pup poodle neighbor's poodle or something. So you just don't want that. So so be really careful with, with some of this. I mean, we got as safe a poison as you can get, but it's still a poison. So yeah, you haven't touched, you haven't touched on bats. The yeah. bats by the front door with bat droppings and leopard moth wings. Yes. So bats, how to keep bats away. Bats are fairly easy because you can disrupt them get them to go somewhere else. Now, the easiest one would be put a bat house up someplace where you don't find them. Just not underneath the overhang. They love to hang out in that overhang at the front entrance and poop everywhere. Yeah, okay. So they're rather, rather, they're okay as a bat. They keep bugs down, mosquitoes are gone. They're highly effective at keeping things at bay, but they're messy. Uh, they don't really have disease. They don't fly into your hair. They don't do any of that. Uh, they just come in and eat bugs. Uh, they're, they're the, uh, I think the repel ball, this one here, there's one that has bats on it. One of these has got bats, not this one, but it might be the one with the red label. You can spray it up there and they go, oh, that's nasty. Basically, you're discouraging them and having them go, you want them to go roost at your neighbor's house. What do you think of the electronic ones that you uh, plug in and it gives that high pitch? I would love for you to try it and tell me that it works consistently. So. I, I hear this all the time. It worked for a while and then it didn't work. I hear that. It's not consistent. I think they get used to it. Although bats, they've got those big ears. It might be more effective with them. So try it. Get it on Amazon Prime. Get it true value. Someplace where you can go return it if it doesn't work. But I don't sell them because I haven't had any real consistency with it. So, hey, bats. What else? Give me something. You know, we have possums. Not possums. We have uh, porcupines. So they're nocturnal. They come in, they're big. They're like this big. They're like toaster oven size or bigger. 
and there's whole packs of them, and they'll strip the bark of off your tree. They'll just sit down at night. Don't, they love fruit trees. They love willows. They love elms. Softer, faster growing uh, uh, trees. They'll sit down. They'll just eat the bark. They'll just girdle it. They'll come back the next night and go, oh, so good. I'll do it again. Slow, methodical. They'll girdle the tree and it dies. Or they'll get up into a limb of a tree, a big limb, and they'll sit right on the limb and they'll start to peel the bark off. So when you're going through the forest, see big, big things of, of bark missing on a tree? Always porcupine. Always. That's how you know. And everyone goes, no, we don't have any of those. Yeah, we do. You've got to trust me. A skunk will come in and they've got, you'll see little holes, perfect little cone-shaped holes in the yard. That's always skunk. Always. Only one thing does that. And they can smell grubs with that point little nose, and they know where a grub is. They'll take the whole paw, they'll dig it out, pop the grub out, leave the hole, move to the next one. So you see several little holes. That just means you have grubs. If you've got skunks, get a grub killer, get rid of the food source, and the skunks won't come back. They'll go elsewhere. So just get a lot of this is just, I know it's common sense, but if you don't know what it is, it's hard to tell what to do. That's where you come and talk to the experts and we can help guide you, guide you through that. In the back. Why, why did the skunk eat through my soaker hose? <laughs> ah, why did the skunk eat your, eat your soaker hose? Because there hasn't been enough rain. I don't know. They're looking for water. They're looking for water. Yeah. yeah. Gophers will eat um, poly line, yeah. the drip line, go after the water. Uh, sometimes javelina, pack rats, squirrels will eat the heads off your, your irrigation. All that means is you haven't been diligent enough at thinning the population or fencing them out or something. So it means you got to get more active with, with things. So we go over some plants. Is that what I did is I went through and I put groupings of companion plants that look good together. I went with native down to more traditional stuff. I got a shrub, a perennial, and an annual with each thing. What would look good together that are animal proof, mostly. We never use proof. We always use resistive. Because generally speaking, they don't like these, but sometimes they do. Oh, let me get this one last thing. Uh, fruit. So I just had two freshly picked peaches for breakfast this morning. They're so good. I had a white one and a yellow one. My mouth is still watering thinking about it. Uh, I've had very good luck in keeping birds off my vegetables and fruit trees with scare tape or reflective tape. Two-sided tape. It's got red on one, silver on the other, and it just kind of flutters in the wind. Highly effective for birds. Keep them off your tomatoes. The secret with this is don't put it up too prematurely. You want to wait until the fruit is just about forming. So, so uh, uh, grapes right now starting to form. Put it on just before, as the, as the birds are starting to eyeball, I go, oh, I can't wait. Next week it's going to be a free-for-all. Uh, that's when you put the strip tape on. Just be real generous. Let it flutter. Highly, highly effective. Okay. Otherwise, you're doing netting. But well, I guess I should pass this around. I think you got to remind me of these. Things. Just forget. Um, I have a javelina, deer, and rabbit list of plants. These plants. I'll get that out to the class. Give me your email. If you're on our main list, it's not going to everyone. It's only going to you all. So give me that email, and I'll have those two lists: deer and rabbit, resistive and then javelina resistant plant, specifically plant, uh, that we're going to talk about right here. Okay? Mm -hmm. This one is one of my favorite plants of all time. I love ornamental kale. I love ornamental, just beautiful. I love pansies around it. It's just a gorgeous plant. And it blooms like this right through winter. So when everything else looks terrible, um, this one looks fabulous. It comes in red, comes in white, comes in green. It is edible, but it's bitter tasting. It's not edible, edible kale. I've got that too. This is just pretty kale. Um, if you've got animals, do not plant this because they will love it. Um, so I have to put it in the backyard where it's protected. Just, that's the lesson. Okay? Be careful. Here I put together three plants. I was going for more blue hues right for this. So I brought a Virginia creeper which grows wild up in the Bradshaws, up in the mountains. This grows wild. You can see it's just starting to turn red now, so this will be its fall color. Another two weeks, it will just be glowing red. I mean, like bright red. By the first part of October, it will be bright red. 
This is a very drought hardened, native, easy to grow vine or ground cover. It's a slow grower. It's a slow grower. I can show you how to make it grow faster if you want. Yeah, come talk to me. What I paired with this was, I was trying to play off the red. I put red salvia. Um, hummingbirds love this, butterflies love it, but animals don't. Again, if you rub it, it's kind of sagey, kind of smells like herbs. So animals don't like to eat this. I've got it right out there curbside, right by the mailbox. They've never bothered this. So it's consistent. Comes in purple, comes in tangerine, mango color, comes in a pink, comes in a white, comes in red. Okay. But for this, I'm just trying to tie in the red. Then I put two blue things together. This is cat mint. Um, every yard should have at least one cat mint. I've got many. This plant grows about this big around, mound shaped, and it just blooms. Nothing blooms longer. This has been. This starts to bloom into March, first of April, and it doesn't stop stop until November. It's amazing. Then it's a perennial, dies back to the ground. Uh, it's very, very drought hardy. It's almost a wildflower. So and a good pollinator. I know bees and butterflies like it quite a bit. This one is a new. Uh, uh, Cat's mint, like, cat. Cat mint. Cat's mint. Okay. This is a bachelor button, but normally for scabiosa, it's a new variety. Usually they're cute little tiny things, lots of little tiny flowers on them. This is like on steroids. Almost has a thistle kind of look. I mean, there's no thorns on it, but butterflies love this. Animals don't. It's a great plant, but here you get some height to it. So that short little thing, I just was trying to play off the blue. I thought it would look good. That just looks good together. And what is the name? So I put them together. Scabiosa, and I forget the, the common name. Go look at it. They're on the table down there. Does it smell? No smell at all. Just pretty. That'd make a great cut flower even. So that's one grouping in a container, out in the yard, in a raised bit, wherever. Companion plants. So you can come up and look at these later and touch and feel as well. Here I went for more of a a lighter color, there's some dark spots in your garden, so it's just hard to get in something bright. So here I took a, a Mythocanthus, what's his name, exact variety. This is uh, Mythocanthus, Mythocanthus, it doesn't have the name. But it's got a stripe to it, variegated, usually these are blue in color. This has got that yellow color to it. So this is very tough, it's a native. It can naturalize and go by itself. This is fully mature. So in the ground, it's going to be about knee high, okay? There, I was just trying to take the, the gold in that variegation. But, oh, let's match that. So I took a gold or yellow daylily and tried to match it. A good perennial. Animals do not bother daylily. They don't bother iris. Uh, they love, live for tulips. They live for crocus. They live for certain kinds of, but they don't like this one. So it's a good choice. And then, I don't think this one gets enough play. I use a lot of this. This is Dusty Miller. Um, it's called Silver Dust, Dusty Miller. I plant it for the foliage. It does actually have a yellow flower that floats above it. This is an indication that animals don't like this plant. It's got this white, hairy fuzz or texture to it. They eat that and they get stuck in their throat and they just can't, they can't swallow. They can't, they need water. They need, something so they don't they leave this completely alone so it's just a good and it's an evergreen just come last fine last for about two years and finally they finally look mangy and i pull them up and start over but dusty miller is a great choice and then the most popular of all marigolds we actually use marigolds as a repellent to keep insects away from certain things but it's got a heavy scent but the animals don't like that scent so they leave it alone I just wanted something bright to come off the, the yellow and the gold. I thought it looked good together. Okay? This one. Oh, here. I brought some other switchables. So if you don't like grass, you could easily go with a cord. Come out of there. It's in there. It's in there. Come, come here. Come out of there. Wow, that's amazing. <laughs> That's amazing. Oh, there we go. There. I could switch this, and all of a sudden now this, this plays all together, gives it more of that English 
garden look. Roses, I've had really good luck with roses. Smaller roses, though. So your knockouts, your shrub roses, your miniatures, your carpet roses, things that have a, that are on their own rootstock. I do find that animals love big roses, big rose hips, like a Mr. Lincoln. They like the big hybrid teeth. There's something about that bud that's very sweet. These are too small, or something happens, or they, they leave those alone. Uh, this is a drift rose, and so it's got, this one I like because it had that fade. It comes out pink and then fades to white, so you see this multicolor to it. This will start blooming the end of April, and it won't stop blooming until I have roses on until Thanksgiving. It's crazy how long it, it stayed on there. So, uh, this one, I'll just mention, because it could go with either way, I'll pinch one of these off and just smell that. It's got a citrusy smell to it. This is scented geraniums. Animals don't bother geraniums at all, but scented geraniums especially, because it's got that heavy scent. Now this one you're planting for the foliage. I plant this out in the backyard where we uh, um, entertain. I like to put it in pots where people brush up against it. So they brush up against it, they kind of smell, or I'll just kind of rub the leaves a little bit as right before the party begins and so that the citrusy smell kind of fills the back deck, the back patio. That's how you kind of use, uh, or potpourri's, different ways to use scented geraniums. This one I put together here, um, just because I loved this hookera, or coral bells, isn't that pretty? That's a new variety, this is called Forever Purple. We just got this in. Uh, hold this foliage for the end of the year, then it'll have some foliage on midwinter. It kind of looks a little rough, but then it, it's one of the first perennials to come back and put their foliage on again. They call it coral bells because these flowers kind of come up and have this little hook, but re you're really planting this for the foliage. I've had great, great luck with the purple varieties. Even javelinas don't bother it. I've had a little bit of, they, they'll eat some of the yellows sometimes. I can't get a feel for it, but I use a lot of hooper in my container gardens just because they're so pretty. Then I match, I mean, that just goes together. The pinks with the purples, it just goes. It's a snapdragon. Every garden is at least one, probably a dozen snapdragons because they're so tough. Um, starts blooming in March, blooms through spring, takes a break in summer, and now they're starting to bloom again. So they bloom in fall and spring. And then when it's done blooming, I'll cut these tips off. It's just a nice little evergreen wildflower. They reseed all over the yard. It's a great little plant. Then I put it with bay laurel, because I know some of you are cooks, chefs. Bay laurel, I have had it right out in Skull Valley where, where elk and deer roamed around, and they left this alone. Again, it's an herb. So generally, all herbs, you're probably OK to go with. Basil, sometimes they'll eat, they, yeah, they'll eat the basil, but all the others, thyme and oregano and things, they, they leave them up, and including bay laurel, personal experience. This, this, gets, this can get pretty big. And then I paired it with this guy. This is a Jazzy Jewels. It's a new variety. This just goes so well together. Look at that. This has got a it's green or blue, whatever, <coughs> just yellow, jazzy, yellow tips to it. But it would be great in a container raised bed with these other to offset some of the other colors. I don't know if it looked good as a hedgerow by itself, but as an accent, great neat new juniper coming out. Junipers are tough. All junipers are okay. So they're drought hardy. Animals don't eat them. You need some junipers. I like old gold or gold junipers myself. Solid gold. I like the jazzy, but when I planted my garden, I didn't have that option. But gold with a real dark rock looks really good at striking. If you put gold in the middle of crushed granite, yeah, it's more yellow. Contrasts work really well together. Okay? And then up front, I put these two, Cotoneaster. Anytime you see the name Cotoneaster, or Cotton Easter is kind of how it looks, how you spell it, animals do not eat this. It looks delicious, but they don't. There's big varieties or small varieties. This happens to be a ground cover. This is as tall as it gets and it puts runners out like this. It gets white flowers in the spring. You'll see red berries on it through the winter. 
It's a tough little plant and it's evergreen. So most of your most of your ketone esters are evergreen. Uh, I'm sure there are some poisonous plants, but I don't know of anyone yet. So uh, ivy. Oh, that's gross. I brought this is a weed. I brought it mainly for the light color. And again, I was going off of trying to accent the purple. This is such a striking purple, such a new variety of hookera. There's probably a dozen varieties down there. I just saw this one. I, I, plants are kind of boring to me because I've seen so many. When I see a new one, I kind of go, oh, cool, that's neat. That's my, my heart still goes pitter batter. So but that makes everything kind of come together and it would spill out. Okay, so that's this grouping. If you want to swap out, if you just don't like junipers or I'm allergic or whatever, um, you could go with that, Columbus Montgrady, Mon or the, what is the botanical on that? Crocosmia. Don't ask me to say that 10 times fast. But animals don't eat this. It looks delicious. Hummingbirds are all over it, but animals don't eat it. And a true perennial. It'll bloom like this for a long time, all fall. It'll finally die back, and I'll leave the, the uh, brown stems up because it's such interesting texture. And then I'll cut it back, usually after the new year, and it comes back fresh. Okay? Let's go down this way. What about soil? Is it needle and a water? All, all of these need some soil no, and water. <laughs> but I'm going from higher water to lower water. I'll get down the native stuff down here. So we can go over exact here uh, after. Okay. Here I put together the Cena Plum, which is a native, drill hardy, tough. You get it started. Yeah. It's got this purple foliage to it. Again, I like the dark foliage. This is related to a KV Plum or Purple Leaf Plum, the tree. This is a, a shrub. So it gets about head high, kind of vase shaped, just nice structure to it. They pink flower in the spring, but animals don't eat this. Oh, yeah, they eat yours. Oh, really? Except for her yard. I'm ready to pull it out. I'm so tired. Really? Oh, they go out there and I look at it. All the leaves are gone. Oh, my goodness. You look, move this. Get rid of this thing. What's this in there? I like that one as well. Pines. We're in pine forest, we're in juniper forest. So animals are used to, they're just training, oh no, junipers, we don't like that. We don't like pines. So generally they'll leave these alone. Resistive. Um, and then you pair uh, flowering phlox. Is a good perennial for here. It's pretty tall, gets up about knee high or so. And maturity comes in red, whites, and pinks. Great drought hardy perennial. Here is uh, Potentia or Potentella, if you're from the Midwest, or anywhere else except the South, where you don't pronounce the double L's. Uh, this one is a low-growing shrub, about knee-high, mounds, and it just blooms non-stop all summer long. And animals, it looks like they would eat it, but they don't. They don't bother this at all, okay? Drought hardy, once you get established, you can go by itself. This I paired with uh, Rudbeckia, which you'll notice here, the stem, where's my knife? You'll notice the stem have a hair on it. You'll see this texture. Mm -hmm. That's that's an indication. You can pass that around just let everyone see it. That's an indicator. When you see plants with this, this defense is what it is. They've learned, I have to do this or animals eat me. And so that you'll see this texture when they eat that, it just gets stuck in their throat. This, Rebecca, they will not bother this. A great perennial reseeds, if you're into birds, sparrows, goldfinches, they love to come in and eat the seed heads. It's a good plant. Again, I was trying to pair it with the yellow of this coming off with that. So it kind of all goes together. And then just to contrast, I gave it this blue lavender. So lavender, they don't eat lavender. Again, if you take a close look at lavender, it's got a texture on the leaves. Plants are brilliant. They're really smart. And they, the lavender has done this. They've done it with fragrance. They don't like the oils. And they've done it with textures. They don't like that uh, um, texture on the leaves. So animals will not bother lavender. And I've had it right out there where I have a lane and get right to it. This is for your my East Coast folks. They don't eat boxwood. Boring plant, which is green. That's all it does. So that's all I'll say about it. Okay, so um, here I put more drill hardy stuff. So in the back I put a, a uh, 
Prickly pear. Prickly pear. It's a new variety that's thornless, kinda. You can actually use that as a house plant. I'm thinking about taking that home and having it as a house plant, kind of in an Arizona room. You kind of need. Now, with these, sometimes javelina will come in and chaw, gnaw on the uh, pads. That's a problem. So javelina can go after them, but all the animal, all the other animals don't. Um, this one they would probably love. The regular, yes, regular prickly pear. They can eat some pads and they'll kind of leave them alone. This is a little readout prickly pear. I've had pretty good luck with this with javelina. Nothing else eats it but javelina. Uh, the last one I planted, I, I had to replant it three times because it kept digging it up. They ate the roots. I don't know why they were eating the roots, not the top, other than the thorn. And I'd replant, of course, cactus. All you do is get them in the ground, they start to re-root. As soon as the roots were done, they were done kicking it around, it, it grew. So they only ate it once and it was done. It was a brand new garden right out there where everything was roaming around. So I think I did quite give it a fair shot. This one I put, uh, this is a wild, um, low-growing manzanita called Knick-Knick. That's the exact botanical. Massachusetts Knick-Knick. It's manzanita. Evergreen, red stems. Mean full. This is tall as it gets and just spreads like this. So each plant would be about four by four spreading. So animals don't eat manzanita of any variety. Then here I put tickweed or coreopterus. It's a great wildflower again. It just reseeds, comes up other places, blooms a long time. It's a good native. I'm just trying to bring out some color because it's a lot of green and blue. So I took the, the yellow snapdragon with the yellow and red coreopterus just because they look good together. And I was trying to play off the blue of the uh, um, cacti that are in there. Okay, and then lastly, juniper. This juniper, I thought, this variety is blueberry delight juniper. It's a low-growing ground cover, but the blue, can you see the new growth is real silvery blue? I was trying to pick up the blues of the cactus, and I thought they just looked good together. Good companions, they take the same water cycle. Once this gets established, it can go by itself, and animals don't eat junipers. That's why I put that grouping together. Then here, this thing's going to bite me, I know. Let me push that back. Yeah. Here, I put more leafy kind of natives. So I started with a sumac, and this is starting to show its fall color. In fact, another week, it'll be in full orangey, orangey red. This is tiger eye sumac. Basically, the foliage is always yellow. It comes out yellow, stays yellow, and then it goes to this orange color. You see it's starting to turn right now. So another week, it'll be bright orange. This is as tall as it gets. Most sumacs get ginormous. Yeah. They get big and they're very aggressive. This guy stays very low. I use this against my pond. Thank you, Ken. Uh, where I've got a real dark pond, big, fairly large water feature. And I wanted something, I can't have palm trees. I wanted something to highlight, bring the eye forward. And I wanted it to be light colored. So it would show off the, the, the depth of the, of the water, which is only about two feet deep. I use tigerized sumac because it naturalizes. I water it for one, one year, then I cut it off of all care, and it's just as happy as can be. So that's sumac. And interesting, again, you'll see this, you'll see the foliage, the, I mean the bark, it's got a fuzz to it, a texture, the defense. This sumac's do it by foliage, uh, by texture on the uh, a bark. Animals, deer graze on wood, basically. Uh, and then it's got a heavy sap, it's very milky. That can be toxic. There is a there is a poison ivy type of a sumac. This is not it. So I don't sell poison. I try not to sell poison plants. You know the guy that will be poisoned is because of the poison plant here, right? It'll be me. So I'm really sensitive. And I'll break out like azaleas. I am I will break out with azaleas like I like poison ivy. It's a weird effect. I'm just spun around myself now. Here, here we go. Okay now. There we go. A dance. You need somebody to follow you. <laughs> <laughs> this is Oregon grape or Mahonia. Again, there's a low growing variety that grows wild in the mountaintop. Evergreen gets a yellow flower, a little tiny berry to it, or grape. So that's the name Oregon grape. I would change the name and call it Arizona grape, but Oregon will do. And dandelions come free. I don't know why that got in there. Where did that even come from? That's weird. I didn't see it. 
great little plant, very aggressive, evergreen plant. The native, these kind of two go together. I thought they looked good together with an oaky, spiky, ferny look. This gets, there's three sizes of Mahonia, ground cover, knee high, and hip, about chest high or so. Three different heights. This is Golden Sphere Coriopsis. It's again a native plant. It's got a double flower though, which is very unusual. It's usually it's a single flower orange that comes out. This was a new variety, and we just got this in. A perennial, again, it will die back to the ground, but it comes back, but animals don't eat this plant. If you take a close look at the, at the foliage, you'll see at the very top of the leaf, here, I'll pass it around. Very top of the leaf, you'll see this spiky, spiky look. If that one's got it too, yeah. It's got it on the bottom and the top, so it's, it's a defense. You gotta take a close look. But the plants are growing those, the animals will not eat them. Okay? What was the name of this called? This is Golden Sphere. Where did it go? Golden Sphere. Coriopsis. There's two or three varieties down there. I just saw this one because I know you all are hardcore gardeners. And I don't want to show you boring stuff like boxwood. I want to show you something you haven't seen before that you're only going to find at Waters Garden Center. Yeah. yeah. See how that goes? There, I paired that with, because I thought these two just went together. Look at that. That's yeah. pretty. <coughs> this is echinacea. Yeah. Um, echinacea is an herb, like an herb plant. This is uh, starting to show its fall color, but it'll bloom for another month or so. I have echinaceas coming up wild in my backyard because uh, I'm a bird gardener. And I'll deadhead these as they're growing the season right now i'm letting them seed i'm, I'm not going to deadhead them anymore i'll let them put on all their seed heads this will be a food source for my birds through winter uh, this is called hot cocoa no salsa red super unusual normally they come thank you normally they come in, in basically pinks to have red is super unusual kind of a, has an herbal smell to it doesn't it, it has kind of an off like an armpit smell. <laughs> kind of has a, kind of like a, here, smell too. <laughs> Which I'm sure is why they don't like it. It's got a texture, you look at the foliage, it's got a texture in the foliage, it's got an odor to it. The birds love it, okay? And I paired it with this. I thought the rosemary kind of came off the blue, that lighter green of these two perennials with that darker blue-green. I thought the rosemary looked really good. This is a ground cover rosemary that just spills over. Yeah. And then it has a long bloom cycle. But again, rosemary, you can cook with this. Oh, yeah. Animals don't like rosemary. It's right out there where everything gets to it. And then I put it with this juniper. I should find one juniper to go with everything. If you've got juniper allergies, these are all females. We don't breed the male varieties. Males are the ones that cause all the issues as usual. Right. They're the ones that have the pollen that go out. They're the ones that turn yellow and they just spew. The pollen is what causes yeah. the issue. Right. Females do not put the pollen on. Yeah. Just the males do. So if you know that about junipers, you can now breed just females and plants. And so these might put a berry on it, but they won't put pollen. They're not, they're not the issue. And if you've got a, a allergy issue, you're surrounded by juniper forests that are full of males. Have you ever seen one explode in the spring? And they just literally go, boom, like a bomb. And pollen goes everywhere. And he's gonna, he's gonna pollinate the entire forest. <laughs> this is called uh, icy blue juniper. This is as tall as it gets. Spreads like this. This will probably be six to eight feet spread when it's all done, one plant. Just this color. So it'd be great against a rock lawn where you've got just too much, it's too sterile something to soften up the edge, but you don't want to go from the top and not have to mow it, this would be a great choice. In fact, this with, these are typically companion plants for the designer. Right. We'll put these together often just to change it up. Catoni aster and ground cover type of junior junipers, but animals don't bother these. Okay, and then lastly, we'll finish up with a couple extras just down below. While we're on native, this is sumac. This is grow low sumac. Sumacs grow wild. This grows wild in the forest. Animals don't bother it because it's got a central heavy uh, um, type of sap to it. It's about this tall and it's famous. It's got this real pretty foliage. It's famous in the fall. Another two to three weeks, this will be bright red and orange. 
stunning, just stunning. Water it for a year and then cut it off of all care. And then switch it over to abuse. And kick dirt at it, think nasty thoughts. And it will still grow and be, be really great for you. Again, a true native. This guy is bare grass. Out in the valleys, you see this growing wild. Uh, Pioneer Park, all the grass you see, that's what this is, in bare grass. This little white flower on it gets about this tall, puts a white flower on, very low care, evergreen. Animals don't bother. Eleagnus, or silverberry. Now the native one has a, is blue. This one, we figured out how to variegate, put a yellow tinge to it, which gives it a little more brightness, I think. I like this one. Um, this one actually has a two-toned leaf. You'll see green on this side, white on that side. So that, that's another indication, animal resistant. When it's got a two-toned leaf, like a sycamore, uh, that means uh, it's putting the secretion on the back of the leaf so that when the animal eats this, it gets that, it gets that hair or texture gets stuck in their throat and they go, ah, <coughs> ah, I need a drink of water. That stuff's terrible. So that, that's what the plants are actually doing that on purpose. Okay. Then, the Californians will like this. Anyone know what this is? Andina or Heavenly Bamboo. Okay. It's kind of boring, there's so lots of them. I put my kids through college grad school on this one plant. Uh, but it's evergreen. This is domestic, it gets tall. I've got some neat new varieties that stay like shorter. They get brighter red in the fall of the year. They're kind of, they got some sex appeal. They look really good. I mean, it's pretty. Uh, so they're smaller and less maintenance. So I've got a good old evergreen. And then I'll end with the most biggest, showiest fall color of them all, pampas grass. It's just, animals don't eat it. Usually animals eat grass, but they don't eat that. Questions, yes. As long as it's nice. Yeah. <laughs> and every year it kept on getting bigger and bigger. Yeah. Finally, my husband said, This is overtaking our yard. Yeah. So to get it out, we had to have some new pieces of equipment. Yeah, back home. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Here we so her, her, point, her comment was she put four of those in because she just loved the plums. They are majestic. Yeah. They're beautiful. Mm -hmm. I would never plant one in my own yard, personally. I'll sell you one. I sell hundreds of them every fall because the plums are mesmerizing. But they are aggressive. They're big. If you do plant them, oh, this is to my friends. My friends. We're just neighbors talking across the fence, talking gardens. Um, I would only plant ivory feathers. It's the dwarf variety of pampas grass. It's got the nice bright white plume, and it's a shorter variety, but still the short one is still this tall this big around. The big one is like 12 by, it's really big. I mean, small dogs, children have been lost in campus grass. I mean, it's just that big. You don't want to plant it right next to your house because it's too big. It's got to be out there, bigger property. So what are you replacing it with? Actually, uh, we mentioned a fence, so one of them is going to be a tree. Tree, okay, good. Tree. Yep. The other ones are now on the other side of the fence, so nothing. Okay, or tree, put the tree on the back side, but you know what would look really good on the front side? Pampas grass. Can you imagine me bringing home a Any last questions? You folks for tuning in on uh, Facebook, thank you for doing that. And uh, we'll try to put the resources as a link at the bottom for you all as well. Thanks for tuning in. One last question, we'll, we'll kind of go off video. I have made a prickly pear. Okay. Why doesn't it flower? So she's got a prickly pear, why doesn't it flower? So we can show you some, some fertilizer that will make it, make it happen. Now, it's easy to overdo fertilizers. At the month of October, another couple of weeks, all you'll hear for us for about a month to six weeks is fertilize, fertilize, fertilize. We're coming into the most important fertilizing of the entire year, fall. As soon as you see that first aspen going to color, the first Amber maple, the first, any kind of fall color. Once you sense autumn is here, which we're really just days away, you need to fertilize. And it, that plant is going to use that fertilizer to store it up in the root structure. And if it goes through a hard, harsh winter, which we can have, it helps it get through a, a harder winter. So, and then it's also going to use that food to flush next spring's new growth, including leaf growth, 
and flower grow. So I think you need to fertilize fall, I think, and I would use the all-purpose plant food. And probably from this class forward, we'll start, that's all, we'll mention that every time, because it's so important. Like, if you're from the Midwest, you don't understand this. You're used to eight foot, you know, soil, and we have eight millimeters. We, or any, we don't have any soil. And so you really want to fertilize more often here, and then whatever you do, stay away from Miracle Grow and Scott. The, those fast release chemicals, they grow, they release so fast, the plant doesn't have time to pick them up. You've got to switch over to organics. And I happen to know a place, and the guy that sells a really good one, I happen to know a garden center in town named Waters Garden Center. And Scott makes, we make our own fertilizer. So it does work really, really well. With that, I'll let you applaud. Thank you very much. Thank you for tuning in.